Hello and welcome to the Inflow on Fire podcast. I am your host, Quinn Curtis, and I am so excited to be with you today and dive into this really sweet subject that is very, very close to my heart about loving what is. And I think the biggest premise of this is to know that this episode is based off the work of Byron Katie. If you have experienced her work, you've read the book, Loving What Is, have done inquiry in the past, let this serve as maybe an inspiration and a reminder to go deeper with that work or to to look a little bit closer. There's so much more depth that I've found. I initially found her work years and years ago and thought it was so valuable and insightful. And then I kind of walked, walked away and, and didn't really do anything with it for many years. And over the past year, it has become like a lifeline to me, truly helping me reclaim my life and get out of the insanity inside of my brain and step into the peace that is always here and always present no matter what. And so if you haven't heard of Byron Katie's work, and this is all new to you, or if you have, I invite you to just, you know, come into this episode with a really open heart and open mind about just recognizing any places in your life where you are suffering and struggling um, and and seeing if there's a way that you could shift what's happening internally, the stories that you're telling yourself inside of yourself um, so that your experience with life could be more peaceful, happier, um, lighter, right? Uh, one of the concepts that I've been really thinking about over the past year as I've been diving into this is the desire to go more sane. Because I've recognized what's happening inside of my head isn't actually sane. A lot of it is insane. It's crazy. Um, and as I'll tell you in, in future episodes to come, I'm sure a little bit about my journey. I have looked insanity in the eyes, in the face, in my life experience. I have I've definitely walk those paths and have been able to really deeply look at what insanity is and what it means to actually be crazy. And it has really opened my eyes to the insanity and the craziness that is just within our world and is so common in our experience, especially with some of the things that we just believe life is, that this is just the way it is. This is just the way life is. Um, and the ways that we sell ourselves short or that we stay really stuck and limited because we are not um, not really clear about what reality actually is. So this has been a major intention of mine in diving in more with Byron Katie's work uh, because it I found it to be such a simple and powerful tool to help me to actually become more sane, more in line with actually what is real. Because so often that insanity in our brains, those stories that are keeping us stuck and suffering and frustrated, feeling like we can't have what we want, feeling like we don't have what we want. Um, those are, it's blocking our experience with the goodness that is actually there all the time in our lives. And it's making it so instead of us being actually connected with what is real, we find ourselves in a state of resistance with reality. And when things are kind of going our way and we're, you know, on cloud nine, it feels a lot less like a space of resistance. But as soon as something comes up that we don't prefer and that we're not excited about, that resistance can come up really strong and can even become all consuming to us where it's all we think about. Um, we could be sitting next to our kids and they could be talking and we could not even be hearing what they're saying. Um, you know, our body could physically be present, but we're not there. And so that's what I found as a pattern in my life is that I just consistently was having a lot of stories in my head and or resistance to what was showing up in my daily life that was making it really difficult for me to love my life and difficult for me to just enjoy what was showing up and enjoy my people. I met an interesting moment in my time as a mother where I, my son, my oldest son, as I've mentioned before, I have five children. My oldest son is going into his senior year of high school this fall. 
and we'll be graduating at the end of the spring next year. This is being recorded in 2023. And so there's been just so many ways over my children's childhood of, of me raising them, of them being all little bitty together and leaving messes all over the house and me being overwhelmed by all the messes uh, and the tantrums and the crying and the whatever to then moving into all the different phases of their childhood that they've experienced. And now looking you know, where I can see the end in sight of this phase of being a mother with all of my children in my home it's really opening my eyes to wanting to be more intentional and connected and aligned to what's actually happening in my life and to the people who are actually here right now because i found that you know as long as my life was kind of going how i wanted to wanted it to then i was able to sure be in joy and like love what was happening and be with my kids and enjoy them but if anything wasn't going how I wanted it, I was gone. And so this truly felt insane. It also felt like everything on the outside of me could have the power to take me away from my kids and away from where my heart wants to be, which is right here, right now. And so it's it's just become very important. I would even say in some ways a matter of life and death because um, my life is happening right here, right now in the present moment. And after so many years of trying to manipulate and control the outside circumstances and the people around me in subtle ways, right, to try to get it to be exactly how I want it so I can be okay and enjoy my life, I'm, I'm recognizing that it's that very struggle or that very act that is creating the resistance to what actually is in my life and making me miss my life. And so um, thus enters Byron Katie and through a really supportive door of that, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Um, she has a beautiful book called Loving What Is, where she introduces her process, which is called Inquiry, which is where you ask a series of questions. And I meant to, I'm going to pull this up right now. So I've got it in front of me. And if you're watching the video on YouTube, you can see this. Um, on the screen. Otherwise, I'm going to put the link to this worksheet in the show notes so that you've all got access to it. But I highly recommend watching the book be, or listening to the book because the way that uh, the book works, it's like an eight hour book. It looks really overwhelming, but the first 30 to 60 minutes is where she talks through, hey, here's how you do this um, process of inquiry. And then the rest of the book is her actually walking people through it of all sorts of different scenarios, including even really dramatic and intense scenarios like people who have survived war and bombings in their hometown or have been victims of really serious abuse. Um, and so it's just really a good thing to even have like in the background as you're going about your day and kind of listening to this, maybe as you're driving or doing something else, um, because it gets you in that mindset of really recognizing, you know, what's true about what you're experiencing and what's just a story that's in your head. Um, and one of the, the things that she teaches that has been like, I swear I'm going to tattoo it to my body at some point because I want to remember it always. I'm always like writing this down everywhere I can, can is the concept that reality is always kinder than the stories we tell ourselves about it. Reality is always kinder than the stories we tell ourselves about it. So this inquiry process um, is I'm just going to share my screen <clears throat> is basically where she has this, this funny worksheet. It's such a funny name and also so powerful called the judge your neighbor worksheet, where you think of a stressful situation with someone, for example, an argument. And as you meditate on that specific time and place and begin to feel what that felt like, then you can fill in the blanks below, um, of this worksheet. So basically 
you know, it's leveraging and using that experience or that person as a way to set you free because your stories about what other people are doing or they should be doing, what life is doing and shouldn't be doing, like is all a reflection of just a story you have going on inside of yourself that is limiting your ability to love what is, to love your life as it is, to love the experience of being alive. And so the types of questions that she asks in here is, Hey, in this situation, who angers, confuses, hurts, saddens, or disappoints you and why? So you're supposed to just let it all out, be your mean, judgy self with this, because you're going to see more clearly exactly what's going on inside your head if you do. Um, but you basically would say, you know, I'm angry with Paul because he lied to me, right, is what you would say for that one. And then in the second one, you're talking about, hey, what do you want? What do you want him or her to do? So, and then the next one is what advice would you give them? They should or shouldn't blank blank. So like in the example she gives, Paul shouldn't frighten me with his behavior. He should take a deep breath. And then your needs in order for you to be happy in this situation, what do you need them to think, say, feel, or do? Um, so in the example, they say, I need Paul to stop talking over me. I need him to really listen to me. And then your complaints, what do you think of him or her in this situation? Make a list. And so they give an example of Paul is a liar, arrogant, loud, dishonest, and unconscious. And then what is it about this person in situation you don't ever want to experience again? Uh, in the example they give, I don't ever want Paul to lie to me again. I don't ever want to be disrespected again. So then basically through this process of brain dumping through this worksheet, um, which is worksheet is just a bridge because it, it gives you a place to test out inquiry. And then as you get practicing it more and more, then the inquiry questions actually just become second nature. And those four questions are as follows. The first question is, is it true? And this is just to be answered with a yes or no. And if it's a no, then you move on to question three. If it's a yes, then your second question is, can you absolutely know that it's true? Yes or no. And then the third, how do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? And then who or what would you be without the thought is the fourth question. And so a big point of what she's trying to help us to do is to recognize that our story is what's causing the suffering, that the actual situation outside of us or what somebody else is doing isn't what's creating that situation inside of us. It's, it's not what's creating the pain. And as soon as we can disassociate from, oh, it's not that person, it's actually my story that's creating the suffering, my story that's creating the pain, it creates this breathing room inside of yourself where then you're able to really see what's real and deal with reality instead of react with your story that you have. And so I wanted to just share this. This is absolutely one of my favorite tools, like I said, but I wanted to just share it in the context of telling you a little bit about what's been happening in my world over the past couple months and, and how this relates, um, how, what this actually looks like in practice. I think that there's a lot of times uh, that we we hear cool tools and tricks. Like you probably heard that and you put it on the bookshelf in your mind is like, that'll be cool to do someday. Maybe someday I'll look into that, right? But my hope is, is that by sharing more of, you know, what does this look like in practicality? Um, what, what has this, you know, what's some stories that can help you relate and add some color to what this looks like to embody this type of a practice and utilize this type of practice, that it will help you to, just even see places where, where a practice might be helpful, whether it's this or another, but also to just get us questioning if our stories in our head are real. I think that's the biggest premise of this episode is just recognizing two things. Is your story real about what's happening? And then the second, um, you know, are you in resistance to what is happening in your life? Um, or do you have your arms and your heart wide open to it? Do you love it? Are you receiving it? Are you grateful for it? everything? All the pieces, right? And I think there's work to do there. So um, for the past, uh, let's see, since uh, January of 2022, um, I had been running my own business for the past 15 and a half or so years prior to that. So a long time, I'd been my own boss running my own business. I had incredible employees. We were doing amazing things. And it was a really exciting 
thing and a, a neat thing to do. And then I got the opportunity in um, February to join a really neat company, and I won't list their their name here, um, but to become a marketing executive at their company uh, and quickly kind of advanced through their company and became the CMO, the chief marketing officer. And I really loved this company in everything that I had been looking for professionally. It aligned like a hundred percent, so close. And I was like, I, if you've heard that, um, that analogy of like, man, when you find what you want, then burn the ships of like, of going back to your old way of life. I did that. I fully burned the ships. I shut down my agency. I brought all of my employees and eventually over six months ended up finding them all positions at this other company. And um, so it, it was like, I was fully invested. I was planning on being there till I retired and I just, I truly and honestly loved it. I worked with incredible people, um, especially had some really special people in my leadership team with my department that I was working very closely with. And I was very close to the CEO and the founder of the company and the president and um, and just loved it. It was such a, a cool space to create. And I was having a blast really leaning into some of those marketing strengths and and bringing that out to serve and support the company. And so about in um, April of this year of 2023, things just started to feel a little bit out of alignment. And I thought it was all situations that would be recoverable. I thought we could get through it. Um, but then later in May, I ended up being the third executive in the executive team to be let go from the company that year. And my whole world flipped upside down. Um, I, I was so close to the CEO, founder, and president that um, I really believed like we were the, a thousand percent aligned. We were all going the same place together. Um, we had a, sh a shared vision and dream. And then I ended up being let go by them. And it was, it, it, it truthfully felt like an incredible betrayal at the time. And um, the way that I was let go did not feel kind and respectful to the level of friendship and uh, respect that we had developed over our year and a half of working together and the level of, of work and, and investment that I had poured into the company generously, consistently. And so it it became a shock. My My whole world changed overnight. I didn't see this coming. And it created a lot of big feelings in me, let's just say. And so, um, you know, as I'm looking around, I'm like, I hate this, you know, in my inside my head. I'm like, I hate this. There a mistake has been made. There is no way that this is possibly what was supposed to happen. And I was like dying in so many ways. In fact, there were there were moments where I literally could not find the will to live and would, you know, was contemplating, man, how do I get out of here <laughs> of like this life even because it was so intensely painful, such an incredible shock and betrayal and hurt. And so, you know, luckily I had been practicing a lot with Byron Katie's work and doing a lot of inquiry on other scenarios that as soon as this happened, I started to reach for those tools of inquiry and it, um, I'm not going to say that it's been easy, but I'm going to say that it, I believe that the way that I've been able to navigate this has been a way of compassion and sanity, which in so many ways is more than I think I could hope for, especially seeing how intensely like I reacted to it, how, how heartbroken it made me. Um, and then just being able to look at it and see all the stories around it that have kept me stuck and in, in pain. And so I wanted to just share a little bit of what inquiry looks like. I, I wanted to read a little bit from one of the processes that I had done to just help you understand like what this actually looks like. Because I think um, one thing I found in telling people the story 
of how I was let go and how this all happened, it was very easy for people to jump on Quinn, uh, team Quinn and like, oh, you were wronged and they're the worst. You're better off without them because I mean, the situations and the specifics of how it all happened in our society's perspective were very obviously like, oh, you were wronged. This was not right. This was not a high vibe choice that they made or whatever, however you want to phrase it. And, but what I also noticed is every time I told that story and I kind of got somebody on team Quinn, I felt pain. Like I didn't relieve the suffering. It confirmed my own victimness. It can like feeling like I had been wronged made me feel even more hopeless and stuck than anything else. And so I kind of had these two choices of of beliefs of believing, hey, this happened for me. And this is, you know, life is always showing up in support of me and um, my life path or, you know, something went wrong or I'm a screw up, I'm wrong. And that's why this happened. And it, it just, it felt um, like either way, they were big, big feelings and big choices to make. And so by continuing to go back to this inquiry process, um, it's really been such a gift. And as we're looking at how do we live more in flow with life and on fire with love and passion and that spark of divine magic and genius and goodness within us and enthusiasm, how do we, how do we bring, how do we live more in flow on fire? I don't believe that we can take our stories with us to that inflow on fire place. I think that our stories are one of the, the most crucial things in our minds that block us from living in flow and on fire. And what I've been relieved to find over my years of studying and then really putting this into the practice with um, the intensity of the past few months is that it really is just that simple. As soon as we address our stories, inflow on fire is right there every single day. Um, and so what, um, was really valuable is there's just been seasons of my life, including what I've, what I've just walked through where it's been valuable to go through and do the inquiry process every single morning. It's like part of my meditation or journaling in the morning and just pick up, is there anything bothering me today? Anything that's, um, that I'm feeling depressed or sad or upset about, and then taking it through that judge your neighbor worksheet, and then throughout the day, as upsetting thoughts or experiences happening, remembering those inquiry questions, which do become second nature, the more you do this, like I said, um, where, you know, that upsetting thought comes and very quickly you're able to say, hey, is that true? Can we absolutely be certain that that's true? And what are we, what are we like when we believe that story? And then who would be we be without that thought or story? Like that has been absolutely transformative. And it's gotten me into a really clear headspace where I I believe I am able to show up in greater compassion and acceptance of what has happened. And also have been able to move forward in really beautiful ways um, with the right intentions. I, I think that there was a space as I was still healing and processing through this, that I, I even had this mantra where I was like, hey, my success is my best revenge because I was angry. I was so angry at what happened. And there, there was that kind of like desire for revenge within me that I was kind of feeding that fire. <laughs> and so I was even like with creating something better for myself or believing that this was better, there was still that well, success is my best revenge kind of aspect of it, which um, still isn't from a healthy place, right? I don't want to build my life on, <laughs> um, you know, any sort of revenge. I want to live in alignment. I want to live in flow and on fire. And that means that the choices that I'm making are aligned with my heart and soul, with my life path, and are coming from a clear, peaceful space of love and compassion, right? And then I'm not reacting to life and making major decisions from a space of reaction. And so in this 
place of like, well, what do I do now? Uh, I ended up applying for like 40 amazing positions that I was highly qualified for and some even overqualified for. And I was, you know, thinking I'm going to go work for a bigger and better company and it'll be amazing. I looked seriously at, hey, do I start my own agency and even offer competing services at some point um, to this uh, other agency that I was working for? Um, and you know, can seriously considered that I have all the skills and the connections and, and could, could do something like that. Or like, what am I really meant to be doing right now? Ironically, this all happened over the summer that I also turned 40, which was a major point of, Hey, what are we doing with our life? And do we want to keep doing it? Um, and what are we doing for the rest of it? Like, what's our plan here? And so that led me to open up some space to, hey, is now the time to make a career shift and move more into a space where I really want to be playing. And so this process of inquiry has been a huge part. So I wanted to just show you a little bit of what this looks like in practicality in my mind. Um, this was some inquiry that I did um, early in June. So I was just saying, <laughs> it's always funny, I guess, looking back at your story <laughs> because you're like, oh, that's totally a story. But in, in the moment, it feels so real and it actually feels so good when you're writing down your story. So you're like, see, I knew it. Like I knew this was right. Like there's that part of you that's like satisfied to be writing this real thing and tearing it apart. Right. Um, so this is what I was writing and in inquiring about. So the story was, I'm frustrated with life for keeping me in such chaos and anxiety. I'm frustrated to still be in the unknown. I'm frustrated that my future is unknown. We may have to sell our house and move if I don't get a job that pays well. I'm so angry at the CEO and president for casting me out like this. I'm so angry at them for firing me. I'm so angry that they are choosing um new leadership over working with me and that they believe that that's better and prefer it over me. I'm so frustrated that my life changed overnight. I am so sad that all of those work relationships I cared about are gone overnight. I can't believe it was all so fragile. I'm angry with myself for trusting them. I shouldn't have let them in. I should have played the game and not believed that I was safe to be vulnerable with them. I'm frustrated with life that I still have to be a marketer instead of an author, illustrator, or speaker. I don't want to be a marketer anymore, but I I do want to have plenty of money. <laughs> I am frustrated that I sold out so long ago to money. I should have stuck to my dream no matter what. And it goes on and on and on for like another couple pages. <laughs> and so I won't share the whole story because it is just a story. But in the moment, this was causing me so much pain because this was exactly this was the lens I was seeing my outer life through. This was what was eating me up inside. These were this was real to me, right? And so always at the top of my inquiry pages, I write that reality is always kinder than the stories we tell ourselves about it because it takes faith to, to, do, to ask yourself questions about our stories and actually get into it. And so when I remind myself, hey, what we're gonna find on the other side of looking into these stories is something kinder than the story that we're we're telling ourselves about it, that life is actually kinder. And so the way that this works is you would take each statement. So you would say, hey, I'm frustrated with life for keeping me in such chaos and anxiety. And then you bring the four questions to that statement. So um, first question is, is it true? Is it true that life is keeping me in chaos and anxiety? And at the moment, maybe I feel like, yes, my life is absolutely doing this. This is a ridiculous part of my journey. <laughs> and so then I would ask the second question, can you absolutely know that this is true, that life is keeping you in such chaos, chaos and anxiety? And always this question, usually, <laughs> at least for me, it always brings me to a clear no, because the more and more that I ask questions, the more that I know that there are very few things that I can know for sure. I can't know the mind of the universe in whatever is happening in my life. I can't know exactly why somebody did what they did. I can't know for sure that they did it because of me. Um, there's just so many things that we don't know. And so when I look at this, um, you know, I'm frustrated with life for keeping me in such chaos and anxiety. Can I absolutely know that it's true that life is doing that? No, I can't. I know that I'm in chaos and anxiety, but I don't know that it's life's fault. Then the next question, how do you react or what happens when you believe that thought? Well, and you just kind of 
close your eyes and feel into it when you believe life is keeping me in chaos and anxiety. How, who am I with that thought and story? And I could see, can see and feel I'm frustrated. I'm overwhelmed. I feel like a victim. Um, I feel betrayed. I feel um, stressed, right? And then who or what would I be without that thought, without the thought that life is keeping me in stress and chaos and anxiety? I feel into that and I feel free. I feel peace. I feel responsible, adventurous, curious, right? So whether or not something outside of me is keeping me in chaos and, and um, anxiety, asking these questions gives me the breathing room to then be able to consider that it might be different. And so then once you've asked those questions, then you turn the thought around um, and so instead of, you know, life is keeping me in chaos and anxiety, one of the ways is I am keeping me in chaos and, and anxiety. My thoughts are keeping me in chaos and anxiety. Life is not keeping me in chaos and anxiety, right? And so then you start to get all this breathing room where you find turnarounds that feel as true or more true than your original statement. Then you start to have some flexibility of that story, your story starts to lose its grip over you. And you start to see, hey, life is just being life. And I can't even know for sure that it's not happening for me, that this isn't maybe the best thing that's ever happened to me. And so bit by bit, as you go through each of the, the statements you wrote down in your story, you get all of this gorgeous breathing room. So this is a really powerful tool that I highly recommend is something that I'll probably be referring back to on some level as just one of those crucial few tools that helps us to live in flow and on fire um, because it helps us to actually get into what's real, to embrace reality and to get out of resistance. And that naturally opens up the space for an inflow and on fire state of being where we can be filled with peace and joy. And so just as a last little thought, um, I wanted to share, not many people know about this other resource that Byron Katie has, but it is pretty game changing and powerful. Here again, another lifeline. I feel like this is like the next step after you've really dove into the work and understanding inquiry which the best way to do that here again is just listening to the audiobook loving what is i find that since our stories are happening inside of our head and it sounds like our voice um then it's really really helpful to listen to other voices uh, because it helps kind of retrain our thoughts more so than if we were to pick up the book and read it and so i highly highly recommend getting the audiobook wherever you get your audiobooks and just plugging yourself into it, help, have it help transform your brain so that you are um, able to see the kind reality that actually is present at every moment and get out of those stories that are keeping you miserable. And then as a part two and an additional support, she has this other incredible book, A Thousand Names for Joy, um, Living in Harmony with the Way Things Are. And this is based off of her husband, um, Stephen Mitchell, he did a really incredible translation of the Tao Te Ching, and this is every verse of the Tao Te Ching that he's translated, and then you have Byron Katie kind of talking through what it actually looks like to live that verse, or what that might look like in practicality and in reality. So, um, for example, I'll just share uh, verse two of the Tao Te Ching, when people see some things as good, other things become bad. And so then Byron Katie writes, uh, when they believe their thoughts, people divide reality into opposites. They think that only certain things are beautiful, but to a clear mind, everything in the world is beautiful in its, only, in its own way. Only by believing your own thoughts can you make the real unreal. If you don't separate reality into categories by naming it and believing that your names are real, how can you reject anything or believe that one thing is of less value than another? The mind's job is to prove that what it thinks is true, and it does that by judging and comparing this to that. What good is a this to the mind if it can't prove it with a that? Without proof, how can a this or a that exist? 
For example, if you think that only Mozart is beautiful, there's no room in your world for rap. You're entitled to your opinion, of course, but other people think that rap is where it's at. How do you react when you believe that rap is ugly? You grit your teeth when you hear it. And when you have to listen, maybe you're a parent or a grandparent, you're in a torture chamber. I love that when mind is understood, there's room for rap as well as for Mozart. I don't hear anything as noise. To me, a car alarm is as beautiful as a bird singing. It's all the sound of God. By its very nature, the mind is infinite. Once it has questioned its beliefs, it can find beauty in all things. It's that open and free. This is not a philosophy. This is how the world really is. Um, and she goes on to say, you know, a mind that doesn't question its judgments makes the world very small and dangerous. It must continue to fill the world with bad things and bad people. And in doing so, it creates its own suffering. The worst thing that ever happened exists only in the past, which means that it doesn't exist at all. Right now, it's only a stressful thought in your mind. Good things, bad things, good people, bad people. These opposites are valid only by contrast. Could it be that whatever seems bad to you is just something you haven't seen clearly enough yet? In reality, as it is in itself, everything, every person lies far beyond your capacity to judge. Once you no longer believe your own thoughts, you act without doing anything because there's no other possibility. You see that all thoughts of yourself as the doer are simply not true. Um, things seem to arise and the master lets them go because they're already gone. This apparent letting go is not some saintly act of surrender. It's just that nothing ever belonged to her in the first place. How could she not let go of what doesn't exist except as the story of a past or a future? She has only what she believes herself to have, so she has nothing. She needs nothing. She acts and waits for the miracle of what is, expecting nothing that would spoil the surprise. When her work is done, she forgets it because there's nothing to remember. It's done. It's gone. She can't see what doesn't exist. Was her work good or bad? How ridiculous. Did it penetrate deeply or have no effect whatsoever? As if that were any of her business. Will it last forever? Did it even last for a moment? Oh, there's so many good gems in here. And it's just, it brings a lot of comfort to me um, in just getting into more of a space of surrender with life, a, a space of harmony with life, instead of staying in resistance and fear and anxiety, even in the subtle ways that those things can show up. I would never have considered myself an anxious, stressed out person, but the more and more that I have looked at what's going on in my mind, the more I see it. And I see in every person around me that our decisions are so driven by reaction and by trying to get what we want or trying to resist what we don't want, those things that we judge as good or good for us or bad for us. And um, it leaves very little room for compassion. And when I really look at what I believe will bring a lot of healing and peace and goodness into this world, it is power of compassion. And that is coming from a space of being able to be with those around us and to see them and hear them and value them and also to see and hear and value the experiences that are showing up for us as gifts every single day. So I hope that this has sparked some interest for you in just evaluating your stories that are going on inside of your head and involving that as part of your regular practice so that you can really connect into the beautiful reality that is here every day. Um, hoping that you take that to heart and I'm cheering you on in it.